13 Questions by Man Transcending Manhood in the Digital Age This week on 13 Questions, we're going to be talking with Micah Hanks, a uh, friend of both of ours. Yeah, he kind of actually, Micah Hanks, probably one of the reasons we ended up getting into podcasting. Definitely wouldn't be as far along as we were. Oh, he helped us out big time in the beginning, yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't be as far along as we are. We might not even ever got into it if it wasn't for a fellow like Micah Hanks. Uh, so, yeah, looking forward to his to his uh, interview. Of course, Micah... Mike, uh, we met, yeah, right before we started our other podcast, Cry America, at the Paradigm Symposium, one of the first podcasts we listened to. So, um, yeah, big shout out to Micah for all that. Of course, Man Transcending over at the website, 13questionspodcast.com, because Micah's got, the, this is one of the longer extensions. I want to say the the bonus app, uh, the bonus app content's almost as long as the free content. This might be a good one to go head over to the 13questionspodcast.com website and, and sign up. Um, we're trying to build the community over there. we got a few members now. We're trying to build it up here and get uh, the Discord going. And, of course, you get access to the communications courses over there as well by TJ Walker. There's five of them, a couple hundred dollars in value right there. And they're, uh, they're about 30 hours each. Each course is about 30 hours of content on different forms of communication and you know it's all about passing down that wisdom and which is sort of what the questions are are formed to do so of course you can get the bonus podcast a couple extensions a week if you sign up for the membership and uh and you get the ability to record your 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 own folks we got a couple people actually already messaged in and said that they're they're working on getting their gear set up to start nice. interviewing their mates that's yeah. awesome and you know what I can see already is the one fella, his name's St. Pauli in the chat. So yeah. That's all I know. But yeah. uh, he's uh, now he's talking about starting a podcast. Yeah. So it could turn out that these interviews stir you into starting your own podcast because yeah. you have so much fun. Or maybe you just become like a uh, 13 questions correspondent yeah, and you just, just go all over that. the place. What if you just have people. like a lot of interesting people? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or you start Skyping them in. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, that's what we're talking about when we say open source for our members is that, you know, we're releasing two episodes a week right now. What if we get a couple of correspondent members? Like we're giving yeah, our- What if we could do a day a week, right? Yeah. Like, if what our if members could... can send us in quality content, like I said, we haven't found any bad interviews yet. And I don't, I think, I really think the only way you're going to get a bad interview is when you get people that aren't authentic. Any authentic answers are, are great. That being said, the other thing I did want to mention, I don't think we've mentioned on an intro yet is that- uh, you know, the questions aren't really set in stone. We've got them there for now. We we have always sort of talked about getting a bigger pool to sort of pick from that we could sort of maybe fine-tune them for each episode or however we want to do it. But, you know, if you think if you think you have some questions that should be in there, you can email us at 13questionspodcast at gmail.com or you can uh, become a member and join up for the Discord and... There's uh, also members-only forums where you can post questions and answer the questions yourself. But, uh, yeah, you do feel free to send in some questions if you don't like ours. Send in some feedback. I don't think we've actually officially asked for feedback yet, but uh, we would like to use these intros as a time to to focus on you, the listener, your journey, and uh, maybe what you'd like to know, what you do know, what you wish you knew, whatever. Um. Anyway, yeah, head over to 13questionspodcast.com today. That's the number 13. And uh, you can just spend a few minutes poking around there and everything's there. Sign up. So Micah Hanks. Yeah, like I said, we he helped us get this thing rolling. I mean, he was integral to the start of our other podcast, The Grand America Show, and he... You know, we met him in, in person at a couple conferences. Fantastic guy. Like, you know, he became a, a friend right away. Uh, he's a writer, a podcaster, a researcher, and speaker, an adventurer, of course, covering a variety of subjects, including history, archaeology, philosophy, science. I can add UFOs and the future of mankind or humankind to that list. <clears throat> he's also, uh, he's authored a number of books, of course. He's a narrator, always uh, lending his voice to audiobooks as well, radio programs. And he's... Uh, 
he's the host of the Graylian Report. That's kind of his more esoteric podcast. And then the Middle Theory, which is current events and his- history. He's also co-host of the Seven Ages Audio Journal, which is a podcast devoted to the study of history and archaeology. And he's uh, he's nonpartisan. He comes uh, to this with a hopeful, skeptic kind of attitude, critically minded approach. And he's, you know, obviously researching stuff like consciousness and unusual phenomena in nature. And uh, yeah, great, great author, uh, great personality in the podcast world. And we're happy to be able to have him on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Micah. Thank you for listening. Uh, without you listening, there'd be no show. And uh, consider membership today over at 13questionspodcast.com. Join the community. Start that journey. Most of all, enjoy these answers. From the one and only. He even wrote the complete guide to Maverick Podcasting. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Enjoy the answers from Micah Hanks. Thirteen questions. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Micah Hanks of the Grayling Report and Middle Theory Podcast, a member of Seven Ages Research, author of The Maverick's Guide to Podcasting, Ghost Rockets, Magic, Mysticism, and the Molecule, Altered States in the Search for Sentient Intelligence from Other Worlds. And of course, he's going to be the next George Norrie. <laughs> I don't know about that. You know, I think George does fine at what he does. If I were going to do anything, I would want to. Oh be... no, no! In twenty years, when you're looking for that that nice cushy paycheck, that's when I imagine they'll be making that call to you. You know, there's a part of me, Adam, that does still love doing live radio. But I was talking with my longtime friend Ray Hobbs yesterday on the phone, who is still charging ahead with his own online radio endeavors with KGRA, and uh, you know, we ha- we were having this conversation yesterday where, for me. A lot of the time these days, as much as I love the live format, I will I will pre-record my radio show in the morning because that's when I'm the most alert and the most awake. And I started finding I you know, it started with middle theory. So your audience ago. needs to be in England. Yeah, right. Well, I've known people who are like that who they will do a show and they target another time zone so that they can be awake and alert, but they're doing a late night show somewhere, you know. I've actually seen people do that before. And in the internet age you can do anything you want to. But yeah, for me, I've I guess I've had to kind of learn that I'm more of a morning person, even though recently on my Audible account, I was just awarded the Night Owl Award because when I can't sleep in the middle of the night, this is the the number one trick I've found. I'm real bad to wake up in the middle of the night. And if I start, I don't dare, dare watch anything on television or on you know Netflix because that stimulates you more. And if I read even, depending on what I'm reading, it can stimulate my mind. I began to realize what wakes me up in the middle of the night is my my thinking mind, it will not go to sleep. But if I can trick it to stop thinking, trick it into paying attention to something else that doesn't involve visual stimuli, I'll go back to sleep. And so I'll put on short stories. I'll, I'll get like Stephen King's short story collections on Audible and listen to a short story. It, it will put me out in 45 minutes. It's remarkable. So I have a Night Owl Award from them. But everywhere else, I think I'm a morning person. <laughs> awesome. Well, you've had a chance to look over all the questions, right? Yes, sir. Yes, I, I'm ready to go. I think I've got answers for most of them. All right. So here's the first question, Mr. Micah Hanks. What was the best advice ever given to you? Yeah, I had to think about this one for a while. And just as a preface to all this, I'm going with my gut on these questions. I try to go with the first thing that comes to mind rather than overthinking it because I tend to do that. And so the very first thing that came to mind with that question was uh, there is a Grammy award winning musician who lives, actually, he lives right in my same neighborhood, uh, but he travels the world. And his name is David Holt. And David Holt is recognized as not only a uh, really world-renowned claw hammer banjo player and traditional musician, but also he's a master storyteller. He's really one of the best of the best. And as a podcaster over time, what I have learned, if, if, if maybe this is another question, but for me, the big takeaway has always been, if you want to be a successful podcaster, learn two things, learn to be a good interviewer and learn to be a great storyteller. If you can do those things, you can succeed at podcasting. Now, the advice that David gave me, being, again, one of the best storytellers really in the world, in my opinion, he uh, and I were driving to Boone, North Carolina. When I was in college years ago, I was uh, you know, studying history and really excelling at that, which said a lot and is really still 
preeminent in my life today, but I was struggling in a lot of the science uh, classes I was taking because they were just so intense and there were so many labs and there was so much math involved and all kinds of things. And it was really just, you know, a whole lot going on. And so I guess you might say I was looking for an excuse to take a break from from college there for a while. And one night David called me and he said, hey, Mike, I've got to go to Boone, North Carolina. And uh, he said, have you got class that night? And I said, well, I do, but I said I can afford to miss. And I actually made an A in that class. That was in an American history class. <laughs> so it was well worth missing that one. But he said, I don't want to make you miss class, but he said, I thought you might enjoy, you know, coming with me to Boone and we can go and uh, Doc Watson's going to be there. That's all he said. Little did I know at the time he had arranged so that I would be able to meet Doc Watson, who again is truly a national treasure, great American guitarist, singer. He was blind and he traveled the world. It never stopped him. Truly one of the most inspirational people in the world. And I got to meet him thanks to David. But on the way to Boone, he said, look, I'll pay you to help me sell some CDs and you can drive me up there so I can kind of rest there and on the way back. And so it was a cool experience. David and I just in the car, going to Boone, hanging out and coming back. Got to meet Doc Watson. On the way there, it was the advice he gave me that has stuck with me over the years. And he goes, when I was young, he said, I wanted to give people the impression that I really knew what I was doing. And he said, from the outset, even if you do know that, if you're new on the you know scene, people are going to be like, who's this new get, uh, kid? You know, so... He said, what I did was he took, uh, he said, I took a thousand dollars and I bought a bunch of like rack cards. Now these days you could do this with Google AdSense, you know, you could, you could, you know, promote what you do online in any number of ways and do it for free. But this was in the pre-internet era. And he said, I bought these rack cards and he said, I started passing out these rack cards that promoted, you know, my act and what I did. And he said, it immediately gave me this credibility. And so he said, what you want to do is if you are new at something or if you are trying to give people the impression that you are an experienced professional, in all the media that you create, present yourself as such. And he said it was the best $1,000 I ever spent. And I've never forgotten that. And then in that same conversation, something else he told me too was he said, you know, I used to travel the world. I used to go to Russia once a year and I would take my act on the road. And as much as I love playing in a band, and at one time I actually played in the band with him. Uh, for a short time as a bass player. But he said, it really became evident to me that if you want to really succeed, be able to do something all by yourself. Same goes for podcasting. I've found, you know, if you really want to succeed as a podcaster, don't have to have co-hosts or guests. If you can do a show by yourself, you know, Dan Carlin does this. Some of the best podcasts are just a guy talking. But David said, be able to do a show by yourself. And then the final thing he said too, is he said, after traveling the world, he said, every time I come home, I'm reminded of one thing. I'd rather be a big fish in a little pond than a little fish in a big sea. And so that's why he does a lot more of his work here at home. And now he's on PBS here in North Carolina, still travels, still marvelous musician and storyteller. But again, you know, those those were some true words of wisdom I got from David Holt early on. That's great. Words of wisdom from somebody who's not looking to be rich and famous, but wanting to hone their craft and just... And although um, that's true... He ended up becoming a Grammy Award winning rich and famous musician as a result of all those things. <laughs> awesome. So essentially believe in yourself and you know that will be your your drive. Is uh there anything you would do to modify that? To modify Yeah, the, oh, the, the best way. advice ever given to you. Is there anything that you would add to that advice that you've learned along the way? Yeah. Although I think David would agree, it's all about, you know, just be yourself. Uh, you know, for me, finding your identity sometimes means that you put on different masks and you go through different phases. For me, I've never been somebody who really takes myself super seriously. And there are people who, when I tell, you know, try and tell jokes on my podcast or, you know, I might wear a bow tie when I give a lecture from time to time, not to try and look like Bill Nye, but, you know, more as a Doctor Who reference or something. There have been people who will be like, you know, you should really look like this or you should really try to be more like this. And I'm going to tell you something. The two things that have worked the best for me are don't take yourself too seriously. Now, you can be, you know, silly. That's a whole different thing. I don't say go around being silly unless you're trying to be a comedian. But again, don't take yourself so seriously and think that you have to dress a certain way or look a certain way or act a certain way if you're going to be taken seriously. You know, be yourself. That's the most important thing. And also, in addition to all of that, what I've found, and a good friend, Vance Pollock, of many years, told me that the, the, uh, the equation, you know, or the recipe for him had been to try and be as generic as possible. <laughs> I always loved that because he said, by being extremely generic through life and experience, trials and tribulations, you come into finding who you are, 
without ending up being somebody else. And so again, if you, if some people are like this, it's like, who do I want to be? How do I want to be? Be generic. It sounds pejorative, but if you're generic, you'll figure out who you are. And that's the most important thing you can do. That's the only thing I would add. Be yourself. Nice. What was the most important lesson you learned from your parents? So many. It's very hard to pick one. But, you know, two ideas come to mind, which are fascinating to me. Um, I think it always comes back to my dad. I've learned so many many lessons from both my mother and my father. But I think that from my father, a lot of that independence came from him. And the most important lesson probably that I ever learned from him was, you know, believe in yourself and do what you want to do. You know, and everything else, if you do it well, will follow. But again, doing what you want to do usually entails getting good at something. And so whether it's music or podcasting, radio, whatever, you know, I've worked, I don't know if you'd call it a storied career, but I've worked in a lot of different areas, you know, whether it's broadcast terrestrial radio, live performance as a musician, I've, you know, been a narrator, an announcer in radio, um, audio books, podcasts, all kinds of different things, public speaking, a lot of that. And so it's like, you know, how do you make a living doing things that you love? Well, be, become good at it. And then, you know, to quote that sage of many years past, you know, there'll be the path to your door. But what my dad always taught me as a kid growing up, he was self-employed. He taught music. He performed and played music. Sometimes he would do odd jobs, but we always lived well. Even though sometimes if there were ups and downs, he wouldn't let the family see that, you know, he would make ends meet is the thing. And he worked his ass off. And that's what I love about my dad. He worked. And of course he does really well now as a result, but so do I, at least in my own way, I'm not rich per se, but I, you know, survive and I succeed. And those are the most important things. And what dad always told me was, again, you know, if you, if you build traits, you know, if you, if you build skills that you can use and then you can put those to work for you, you'll never be looking for a job. And it takes years to do that. But once you do the freedom that you can know from being able to be your own boss, there's nothing in the world like it. And anyone who's self-employed knows that. And I love it. I wouldn't ever change it. I have my father to thank for that. That's awesome. Yeah. I've, I've really fallen into the skills over goals idea that if you have a goal, you're going to get to it and you, you know, you could fail and what have you gotten, but if you have a skill, something that you're going to learn, no matter if you succeed or not, you'll put that in your pocket, you go do something else. And, you know, I think, uh, Scott Adams said it best. He's like, I'm, and he's the author of Dilbert. He's like, I'm not the best cartoonist. I'm not the best entrepreneur. I'm not the best businessman, but I'm a businessman. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a cartoonist. I've done all these things. And when you put them together, I can be you know, the greatest cartoonist in this genre over here and, and become very good at it. Not because I'm the best, I'm not, but because you've got all those other skills. And that's what I love. Your dad's essentially saying, hey, don't worry about failing. Just do what you love and learn to do it good. You know, keep trying. Yeah, there'll always be someone at a skill who will be better than you are. That's the truth, you know? I mean, I'm a pretty good guitar player and I've played guitar for, gosh, I mean, close to three decades. But I was watching videos of Ingve Malmsteen on YouTube the other night, uh, you know, who he was kind of, you know, one of the, the perennial, uh, you know, hair metal era guitarist virtuosos, you know, and I was watching videos of him and it's funny because two things I've noticed are that one, he doesn't seem to age, which is kind of weird. He still looks like he stepped right out of the heart of the 1980s, <laughs> which is kind of a <laughs> shtick, but man, his technique hasn't diminished at all whatsoever. And he still gets up on stage. He's throwing kicks. He's tossing picks at people. And he's doing these sweep arpeggios that literally would just knock you on your ass. And I'm like, man, you know, there's always going to be somebody out there who can do it better than anybody, you know, like Ingve. But then you got guitar players who they may not be Ingve Malmsteen, but they're really good at what they do. They can market it. They have the look. They can pair that with singing or they have a great tight band. Again, you know, it's all in what you do with what you've got. Be good at what you do but know that you'll never be the best. If you're good at what you do and you compare that with other skills and traits, you will succeed. I promise. Phenomenal. Okay. Next question. What book has been most influential on your life and why? Again, it's really hard to say, but uh, the, the most influential book on my life, there are two that come to mind, but the, the most influential is Stephen King on writing a memoir of the craft. Really? Yeah. When I was in college, I took an expository writing class, and my teacher, Mary McClurkin, was really supportive. And, I mean, 
again, I could see the areas where I would excel. You know, I loved science and I would do really well in physics, but I would take biology. And anybody who studied all the physical sciences knows that biology is challenging. And I could, if I, if I devoted all my attention to biology, I could do really well with that. And actually I thought about that too, because I love biology, but for me, English and history are just, it's like effortless because I can remember, I have a great, you know, you know, memory retention and writing is something that just, you know, came naturally to me where I would see other kids doing great with math in school. I could see that they couldn't form sentences, you know, they couldn't spell worth a damn. And for me, I mean, it was like, I was, it's, it's weird. I was born a writer and a person who, you know, thought generally in terms of, you did know, your gift of gab go along with that or yeah, did that develop later? Ever since I was a kid, I think I always was, I mean, you did, you definitely, if you work in radio, like I did, you develop that kind of thing, but it's definitely something I had since I was a child. I loved telling stories even when I was a kid. But again, when I was in college and I took that expository writing class, my teacher, Miss McClurkin, uh, I remember her telling me when on my final exam, she gave me an A plus plus and wrote at the top. She said, this is publishable. Wow. And then she, and she told me, she said, if you work on your writing, she said, you got this. She says, you need to start writing and, and try and publish. So I started trying to write for newspapers, but I was in the library in between classes one day and I went down into the, the basement of the, the library and they had, you know, I usually was spending a lot of time in the tech area because I loved books on robotics and things like that. But I just randomly went down downstairs one day and they had a fiction section way back in the back and in the back of the library were all the Stephen King books. And keep in mind, this is a technical college. So, I mean, you know, naturally there are going to be a lot more, you know, skills and trades and things like that represented in their library. But in the Stephen King section, which was the fiction section, they had his book on writing. And it was the funniest thing because I would go in between classes every day and pick up where I left off. Nobody ever checked out the book. I would always sit down there by myself and read it. And I never checked it out either. I would go and read it in the library. There was something about the experience of reading that book in the library. Um, but I remember reading that and thinking, you know, based on what my teacher had said in college and also what I read in that book, I was like, hell, I do want to be a writer. So I started trying to write fiction and I couldn't get a damn thing published. But the second article I tried writing in terms of journalistic writing, you know, started pitching stuff to magazines and newspapers. The second article got published. And so I became a writer. <laughs> but that book and I eventually I'm going to come back around after having you know spent 15 years writing other things. I want to come back around to fiction. But it was Stephen King and that book that made me go, wow, you know, maybe this is something I should do. And I don't know why I'd never thought, hey, I should be a writer. I want to write before that. But sometimes it's stumbling into something like that and, and reading somebody else's story. Or like on a podcast like this, you hear somebody else's story. It makes you think, wow, that's like me. Maybe I should do that too. That unequivocally is the most important book I think I've ever read in my life. Awesome. Are you a Stephen King fan? Is that what you, you drew you towards it or – was I'd never read Stephen King before I read that book. That's awesome. I'd never read anything by him, but after I read that book, I started reading his novels. And honestly, they're hit or miss. I loved Salem's Lot. There are other books that I think are formulaic and, you know, but there's a lot that could be said about that, including the volume of material he was churning out in the 1980s when there was a big publishing boom. And so there was a demand and you could tell that some of the books didn't have the same thought an energy that had been put into them to meet the rec you know the requirements of an industry that was really booming at that time as others but then you look at something like you know the gunslinger the first in the dark tower series it's almost as though it were a different author who wrote that book when compared with some of those other novels and it's in my opinion one of the finest you know modern fantasy novels ever written and so the best of his work makes up for anything else that may have been written but then again that's all preference so I started reading his books only after I read On Writing. Yeah, I'm definitely a Stephen King fan, but above all that, I can't thank him enough for being essentially a guy. I, I've heard that from Joe Rogan, actually. He talks about his book on writing. I wonder if that's the same one, if he's written more than one, but oh, no, he said it was just one. So it'd have to be the same one. Yeah. Now, this question, Micah, I'm interested because you've talked about this on your podcast in the before in relation to... <laughs> <laughs> in relation to coffee. <laughs> oh, you what, know the answer then, yes. <laughs> what what daily habits or rituals do you have, and do you re recommend them to others? Yes, I do, and yes, I do. I have um, the daily ritual of black coffee first thing in the morning, yes. <laughs> you know, and you and I have hung out uh, plenty uh, in the past so that you know that if I'm anywhere in the morning, I'm getting coffee. <laughs> well, I know. I find it interesting in this question because in asking this of other people, 
I didn't associate it. And when we've talked about it, you know, in the true sense of a ritual, something that you commit to every day, something that you put intention into, that you set apart the time and the space, like, you know, that, that is true ritual. So anyways, I'll let you answer the question. Well, but do you remember, (laughs) you remember Gary Evans back in 2013 when you and I actually first met, Gary was there with us and uh, Gary's from England and he's a wonderful spiritual person. And yeah, I used to. And I need to hit him up because we haven't talked in a couple of years, but we used to stay on Skype pretty regularly and talk about things. Um, And he and I are still dear friends, but we used to talk about our morning ritual. And we used to joke because I think for him, I think Gary liked tea more than he liked coffee. But I mean, I told him, I said, you know, truly to me, I literally referred to having that black coffee in the morning as my morning ritual because it was what started my day. It gets my neurons firing. I mean, I can live without it. But I don't like to. And it's not so much that I need. Some people are like, they get up and they're like, oh, God. You know, and they just, you know, they're pouring coffee all over themselves. You know, they take a bath in it, you know. I don't need, you know, the coffee to get going in the morning. I can totally do that without the coffee. But I enjoy incorporating the coffee into a part of my daily routine, which is why I consider it a ritual. Um, There are some mornings where I love to just stare into the dark coffee, the abyss, you know, kind of like in that Nietzsche sense of, you know, staring into the abyss and letting it stare back at you, or almost like the the ancient tradition of mirror gazing or scrying. I mean, black coffee scrying, I've talked about that before, and I mean it in the most literal sense. So in more ways than one, I could say that black coffee in the morning for me is literally a ritual. I'm not trying to divine the future. I'm not trying to do anything any more than just collect my thoughts when I do that. But, no, I but, get that. It, it reminds me of feng shui where you rearrange mm-hmm. a room because you're trying to look at something that'll that'll make your thoughts bounce in a different way. It's not necessarily it's true divination. It's it's you know, it's why I have lava lamps in the studio. I turn them on because I can look over and it just it it it, it stimulates, you know, things in the back of my mind with shapes that I'm not used to seeing around me. So that, yeah, I never thought about staring into my drink and, you know, looking at the the little bits of tea swirling around in the bottom. Well, it works. Yeah, again, you hear about reading tea leaves. And so that's, uh, you know, another uh, reference to, uh, you know, ancient practices going all the way back to ancient China, but even more uh, modern theosophists and practitioners of spirituality here in, in North America incorporated that into their, their, you know, ethos. Now, again, for me, that's not necessarily a part of, of, you know, what I do, but I will say this, if you want to engage in the mirror gazing aspect of it, it definitely helps if you have, you know, a flat black liquid in your, in your cup and coffee is the way to go with that. Um, yeah, so that, that is truly, truly my morning ritual. And, um, there may be other things, you know, little meditations throughout the day. What do I want to do today? Making lists. I'm a big fan of making lists and things like that. But honestly, I think that you can think so much about certain things that you're overthinking it. And there's a side to me that a lot of people mistake for being, Oh, Micah just kind of goes, he just kind of, you know, gets up and just does whatever he feels like. That's not true at all. I actually have a pretty structured lifestyle, but the trick is within your structure, make room for spontaneity, you know? And so for my ritual, the coffee kind of inspires creativity and that is very spontaneous and so if you really want to succeed you have to have structure in life wow to do that. no i love that that reminds me of the war of art mm, where yeah. it's it's sit down spend the time so you're you're every day you're 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 committing to a certain amount of time in that you're going to devote to the muse of creativity whatever you want to call it that that's cool mike i never even thought of that correlation that that's Man, you just condensed that entire book down into like a 15-minute ritual. Well, it's the great paradox that, you know, if you are going to want to be successful at creative endeavors like art and things like that, writing, that you have to use discipline. And it's like, but you'd think that discipline is the antithesis of creativity. Well, no, it's not. I mean, the trick is, is finding the balance between the structure and the spontaneity. If I were to ask your best friend, What was the one thing that they would say you need to work on the most? What would it be and why? It would be looking after myself. And that's not because I'm a self-destructive person, you know, or anything like that. But I am a person who is, I'm I'm naturally a giver. And so I'm always thinking of others. And uh, that has been a problem for me in life that I give so much of myself to others that uh, at times I feel like I'm giving myself away. You've heard that expression, you know, pound of flesh, you know, once they've had their pound of flesh, you got to be careful because in life, people will take from you as long as you're willing to give. And, and that occurs both 
physically, it occurs psychically in the sense of just mentality. And I'm not talking about ESP or something. I mean, but in this, in the psychic sense, look at what happens on social media. You know, there are people who, in order to elevate themselves, they will, you know, take jabs. They will make attacks against you, and all of that, in a, in a way, is kind of a give and take. So on a number of different levels, you have to always be aware of the fact that people are always looking for something that they can get. If you give them a foot, they'll take a mile, as the old saying goes. For mm-hmm. me, I'm someone who's so willing to try and change the world. I mean, and not to say that I'm good at that necessarily or succeeding at changing the world, but it's what I aspire to do because for God's sake, if you aren't contributing to the world and the betterment of everybody around you in society, for God's sake, what are you doing? It's not saying that it's for everybody or that everyone should do that, but as far as my person, you know, I want to try and help people, help others, and change the world. I, those are the things that I want to do, and I see value in that, and I appreciate other people who do it too. But yeah, my friends would absolutely say, you know, remember to look after yourself. You can give so much of yourself that you give yourself away completely, and then what's left to give, right? All things in moderation, I think. No, that's that's cool. I'm I'm the opposite. I have the opposite problem where I have to. I, I'm, I'm less giving, but what, what I like about that mentality, cause it could be a negative if you take it too far, but there's always that person out there who says, you know, this person did something for me. They helped me out when nobody else would, there's no reason they should have, you know, that, that, that last ditch they've hit in. And, and so that's beautiful because you, you can be that opportunity for that moment to line up is as long as you're keeping your eyes open for red flags, that's, that's kind of cool, man. Well, yeah, you do have to, and that's the trick. Again, as with all things, I mean, really, I do that podcast called Middle Theory, and a lot of people are like, oh, that's politics. I don't want to listen to that. It's it's not just politics by any means. I mean, really, I usually open each program with some discussion of, usually it's a blend of philosophy and history, but I'll take something maybe that's happening in the world, and I'll, I'll you know, approach it from the context of let's compare that with something historical. And then we apply some philosophy to it. Or I'll talk about Nietzsche. Or I'll talk about, you know, a philosopher. Um, You know, Daniele Bellelli of the History on Fire podcast and Drunken Taoist. You know, uh, the Seven Ages guys and I did an interview with him a while back. And I featured a short clip of us just riffing on philosophy on middle theory. And so, really, what that podcast is about, more than news, current events, or any of that stuff, it is about the philosophy of moderation, understanding balance, and then applying that worldview to things, news, current events, politics, history, you know, whatever discussion you want to have about whatever subject, ideas are the most important thing to be discussing. But again, to me, the middle theory, which is borrowed from the idea of the middle range theory, and that was in large part a creation of my uh, longtime friend, uh, Christopher McCollum, who was a co-host on the show for a number of years. But You know, we were both looking at, and he was in law school at the time, so that was probably where the idea came from, but we were looking at the idea of this middle range theory. And I think that working with that, we came up with middle theory, um, which is not explicitly in relation to the law concept we were talking about, but the name nonetheless, I think, and that idea too applies, finding the the common point of agreement, you know, and, and you apply that to all of life and you begin to realize balance is key. So, Micah, what are you most curious about? Yeah, what am I most curious about? I mean, I am a scientific thinker. And so much so that I am willing to challenge scientific paradigms when I think it's necessary, but not in a frivolous way, just for the sake of, well, I'm going to be that guy that challenges every consensus model. Or I actually don't. And if anything, one of the critiques I get more often is that people think that I'm too in line with consensus scientific attitudes toward things. But there is a reason why I'm such an advocate of those, which is beyond the scope of this conversation. With regard to the question, what am I most curious about? I really think the thing I'm most curious about is, you know, what is life? And, 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 and for something to be a life, it has to basically, I guess, again, there are different modes of self-awareness. I mean, you could say that an animal is aware and certain animals are more self-aware than others, but self-awareness in the sense of being able to stare into, you know, a reflective pool and realize that's me. But then there's the question beyond that's me and I know who I am, you know, I think therefore I am in the Cartesian sense of things. There is the further question, but what does it mean to be me? What does I am mean? We are alive. We have some idea of what it means to be alive. We have some pretty good ideas about the 
mechanics of the universe. You know, and we can thank guys like Newton and Einstein and the late Sir Stephen Hawking and others for that. But at the end of the day, we really don't have a full picture of what this is. What is consciousness? Is consciousness such a thing or is that an illusion, a byproduct of other neurological processes? I mean, what the hell is this all about? Is there other life elsewhere in the universe? If so, would we recognize it as such? Is this the only form that consciousness can take? Is life antithetical to the idea of consciousness? Is it just such that we are a hiccup of biology, if that's such a thing, anywhere else in the universe, and that this is the form of consciousness that we take? Will we create new forms of consciousness? You know, God made man in his image. What happens when Adam makes something in his image? Ray Kurzweil says then we'll have made God. It kind of is a strange circle. And yes, I'm talking about artificial intelligence there. But that's what I'm most curious about is what does it mean to be us before we understand the implications of alien life elsewhere in the cosmos or artificial intelligence we may be yet to creating, you know, or yet create some down someday down the road. We need to understand what we are and what it means. And we may not reach those conclusions until we meet one of the two aforementioned extraterrestrial intelligence or perhaps we create AI that can inform us on these things. But are we ready for that reality? I'm not sure we are. All the big questions. Yeah, neatly wrapped into a little cinnamon bun there. So, <laughs> no, that that's nice. That's uh, that's ninety percent of what occupies my uh, my gray matter too. So, I know that's what we sh- seem to share in common. Always have, <laughs> which is why, by the way, in the back seat of a cab with Laird and Risa Scranton years ago, I told you, I said, "Man, you need to podcast." You remember that? <laughs> that's right. And here I am interviewing you on a podcast. So yeah. you predicted it. So you're also a Precognitive. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I guess in the Sherlock Holmes esque. No, actually, you know what I'm going to say, and this actually goes towards okay. <laughs> what what you were talking about earlier. Belief. You know, even if you can't do it, fake it till you make it. Believe in yourself. And but this is true because when you see talent in other people, you can give them that belief. You can go, "No, I see it. I'm going to let you know about it." And and I've learned that I trust you. Like we've become friends over the years and, and I know about you and the way that you think and do things and, and, you know, um, j- just, you know, your character. So based on that, when you give me an opinion, I trust you. So when you say, I believe and so that's kind of cool that, you know, oh. huh? Yeah, no, that is really cool because that's true. See, I wouldn't have said what I said to you so long ago if I didn't, first of all, it wasn't just, ah, oh, you could do a podcast. I mean, I was like, no, 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 you know, you have the gift of gab too. You know, you always are a, a very intelligent person and, uh, in terms of the way that you, you know, vocalize your thoughts on things. I remember one time we were all having a conversation and I started to say something and something else I liked about you is you go, hold on, if, if you don't mind, I just want to complete this thought. And you, you, it's funny because most people wouldn't do that, you know, actually tell somebody, Hey, hold on just one second. And, and so there's an analytical side to you too, in the sense that you are like, I want to complete this thought too. I don't, I'm not just talking just to be able to talk. And so when I told you in the back seat of a cab, three or four years ago, you should podcast. It's because I believed you could be a podcaster. You know, I see the the natural talent there and all those little things were so evident to me, but yeah, that's, that's really cool because yeah, the idea of someone else believing in your ability to do no, something. I, I like it. It's uh, you can't tell if a woman is interested in you, your buddy's got to tell you, yeah, she's totally into you and you can tell when your buddy. So yep. it's the same type of thing. And once you have belief, you know, if you believe in yourself, man, like that's the drive. Cause yeah, All right. So what was the most embarrassing experience of your life? This is a weird question for me. um, And I'll tell you why. Because it says a lot about me. I have a really hard time thinking of embarrassing experiences. Um, I've had them, many of them. But as with when you ask this question today, I remember years ago when I worked in radio, we were on this program one night and a friend of mine who was hosting liked to do this segment in the second hour where he would just kind of, he would bring up really off color news stories and stuff because the, um, the time zone that the show aired in was during safe Harbor and he loved to milk that and actually got written up and got some warnings for it because he would push it a little too far sometimes with some of the things he would talk about just to see what he could get away with. And so he loved to kind of have raunchy conversations. And I would occasionally go in there on Saturday nights and produce that show. And uh, as a producer, he would always get me in on the conversation. And one of the things that he asked us one night, he had a whole panel of people in the studio and he said, what was the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you? And so there were some crazy stories. You know, one of our panelists was a very attractive young lady and she talked about how 
uh, when back when she worked in radio, somebody who had been a neighbor of hers for years came up and talked to her and said, I remember that time you used to, right in front of everybody, said to her, you know, we used to watch her sunbathe in the nude in the backyard of her house at her parents' house. And she was like, what? You know, and it's like, wow, wonderful to know that when all those years ago, when I'd be laying out there tanning, there was somebody up on the mountain watching and this guy comes up and says that. So those were the kind of stories. And they got around to me and I kind of was like, you know, it's weird. I don't really have a story. And everybody was really let down. They're like, come on, Micah, you know. Once again, many years later, this question comes up and I'm thinking, you know, I can't really think of something that was so embarrassing. And I think the reason why is because in terms of the way I look at things, I don't, I don't get caught up on the things that I feel like are embarrassments or shortcomings, but I do this often. I do when I become embarrassed in a public situation, I think about those things and go, now what do I learn from this experience? So to me, I don't see an embarrassment as a shortcoming or a failure so much as a learning experience. And I think that's why every time I'm asked that question, I can never think of something. Can you think of anything that would be really super embarrassing? Just like it, your bono. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's your the one thing that like dancing in public, you know, that that one thing that people have, you you know, you might be a great speaker, but to be the one in the middle of the dance floor is a different story. That is so that? true. And I, I would definitely say that, that, um, yeah, anytime I have to dance in public is one of the most embarrassing experiences <laughs> that I've ever had. I was at McNonymous's wedding this past summer. And our wonderful friend, Michaela, who's a bartender from New York, and she's tough. I love Michaela to death, but she is such a good dancer. And our friend Davi and I were sitting over here at the table. He says, come on, man. You know, Davi, I believe, is from Brazil. And uh, he goes, come on, let's go dance. He says, you know, I'll get her and you you grab Michaela. And, of course, Michaela had been his date for the, uh, you know, for the uh, wedding. And so, I, again, here I am, you know, two left feet trying to dance with Michaela, who's one of the better dancers you've ever met. And it was so funny because she was, rather than trying to, to, you know, make me feel good about it. <laughs> I think it was all over Michaela's face. What are you doing? So, yeah, uh, you know, all the salsa dancing lessons and everything else, you know, notwithstanding, there's some dancers that are really good and they really feel it. And again, I'm a musician, so rhythm and timing and things are good for me. But, um, and I've even had people tell me that, that you are a good dancer, but I think it's all about who you're dancing with. And when I was on the dance floor with Michaela, I can tell you one thing for sure. I was not a good dancer, <laughs> so <laughs> you know. But yeah, so you could say any time I've ever tried to dance in public, that's probably for me because to me it's a really personal thing, rhythm. You know, and and having to share that side of yourself, there is an embarrassment to that because it's like you know putting you know, putting yourself out there. You know, so I don't know. You should it's, you it's should a, try to do it more. You should try to uh, embarrass yourself. I probably yourself, should break, break I sh- that. I should go dancing more often. I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to call Michaela and be like, "Baby, it's you and me." <laughs> All right, next question. What quality do you most admire in a man? Uh, I think, yeah, so for this one, strength that is felt rather than shown. But I would like to, as you know, give you an example. I've met a lot of very strong women and men in my life. And, uh, and my dad's one of those strong men. My mom's one of those strong women, but apart from family members, one of the strongest men I've ever met, uh, was commander Pete Kletsky of the U S Navy. Uh, and this is the husband of Chase Kletsky, our friend and Pete at the time, I think, was the XO on the naval base where he was stationed. And uh, Caleb and I went down to uh, Georgia to visit with Chase for a few days. Caleb's my brother. And she said, well, I'll get my husband Pete to get you guys clearance and take you out on the naval base. And you guys can go tour. Oh, that's fun. You. Yeah. And so he got us clearance and he took us out to the naval base. And we toured uh, the USS Alaska, a nuclear submarine. And um, that was a remarkable experience. But let me tell you. The thing about Pete Kletsky is that when he showed up for breakfast one morning, he'd been working an all-night late shift, and so we all went down to breakfast, and this is the first time I meet him. He comes downstairs in his you know bare feet, you know, T-shirt and some you know jeans, and he sits down for breakfast, kind of soft-spoken. Morning, Micah, you know, and just sits down across me, and we're talking, you know. And, and it's fascinating because he was the warmest, sweetest person, but knowing who he is, 
knowing his service, you know, to the common good and to our country and knowing what he's gone through and some of the things he's done, which in the name of national security, I'll never know about. There was an impos- an imposing aspect too, along with that warmth and him sitting across from me was fascinating in that sense that I felt pure strength, you know? And so he takes Caleb and I out. He drives us out the next day to the base and takes us on the, the, the base. And of course I'm seeing men straighten up and salute, sir. Yes, sir. At ease gentlemen, you know, cool, collected boy. People talked about Barack Obama, you know, and when he was in office being so cool, they'd, they'd never met Pete Kletsky. I mean, this guy full, full fatigues, you know, full, you know, naval fatigues and everything at ease gentlemen, just so cool. Takes us on this nuclear submarine and then takes us to the Irish pub on base just to have a beer with my brother and I. And that was the most humbling thing maybe that I think I've ever experienced. Uh, you asked about embarrassment in the last question, but the most humbling thing is sitting there with Pete Kletsky in an Irish pub on a naval base, and he insists on buying you a beer just because he wants to talk to you. And I'm thinking, why do you just want to talk to me? And so before we left, he'd had to go back to work, and uh, he wrote a handwritten letter to my brother and I and just said, you know, both of you guys, you know, I just I want you to know in our household, you know, you, you'll be remembered as family and don't be strangers. I almost get choked up thinking about it because, you know, when somebody who has that much pizzazz, that strength, who you feel it, but he never shows it, you know, it emanates like an aura off of him. And, and, and he goes out of his way to make you feel you know, I was going to say a man with a lot of responsibility, a short amount of time. I mean, that's, you understand the value in what he's offering you and his words. Every, that's, that's pretty cool. And every person, I think you got to meet him too. You met him, didn't you? Yep. You got to meet Pete. Oh yeah. yeah. I he, mean, he was Captain America. He is Captain America. He isn't, and he, it's, it's not like he's wearing like, you know, U.S. flag shirts or something like that. It's not patriotism. No, he, 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 he's definitely it. You go, you meet him, you're like, you Air Force, you you uh, you Navy, like you 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 see that pride. It's you yeah, it's you feel it. Guy. You feel it more than you see it, Adam, and that's the thing. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that that familial connection to a guy who, like you said, I mean, he is the epitome in my in my mind of walking the walk and talking the talk. The most powerful guy I've ever met in the sense of the feeling of strength that comes from him, but. The kindness and the compassion, nothing, nothing will break you down to your core, you know, and, and humble you more than being in the presence of somebody like that who makes you feel like you're worth a shit. And that's that that truly is uh, the the thing I think I learned from that experience is you know if you really have strength, you don't have to show it; people will know it. Who are your role models? Well, apart from the aforementioned. <laughs> um, you know, and it's okay if it's the same. I mean, you can just leave it at that. I mean, it's it's a wonderful you know marriagement. Yeah, people people like Pete Kletsky unequivocally are you know role models to me. But there've been a lot of them over the years. I mean, in in terms of politics, you know, I've looked at guys like Noam Chomsky, and on the other side of the political spectrum, you know, William F. Buckley. You know, intellectual commentators who have you know they may not always agree on all the points, but they nonetheless have the same objectives. They may have different ways of going about it and they, they try to fight those battles with their intellect. And that's something that's always appealed to me in the modern sense of things. Again, some of the people that I really appreciate and I don't always agree with on all points, Sam Harris. I think Sam Harris truly is a great American intellectual. If you want someone who's a little more out there in his thinking, you know, Jordan Peterson, I don't agree with Peterson on everything, uh, but I also see merit in in the things that he does, especially on the things that I do agree with him with. Nobody's going to be right on everything. It's it's, right. it's insane that people even think that. You know, look, if you it's it's the the Christian belief that I'm not going to read, you know, the Torah because you know it goes against my religion. Well, read it. You know, you yeah. might find some valuable information. Broken clocks to write twice a day. If it speaks to you, take it. You know, exactly. you know, it, 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 yeah, I know everything, you know, we don't, everything gets restructured. Everything gets renowned. We're in an evolving universe and who knows if the laws and everything else aren't evolving too. So just humble yourself, sit back and, you know. Yeah. And to an extent, the people who inspire me the most sometimes are the ones I disagree with the most because they inspire me to think. What institution of society or structural aspect of modern life would you change given the chance? There are a couple, but the, the, the most important one, I think, is 
in my opinion, and I've seen good arguments for and against this, but I do, I'm not a huge fan of the two-party system. <laughs> uh, I understand why it has succeeded in American politics over the uh, centuries. And uh, again, you know, William F. Buckley from the more conservative side of, of you know American thought had once argued in the mission statement of National Review back in the early 1950s. He said, you know, we must fight against essentially uh, centrism and the Fabian promises of multi-party, you know, whatever. He he believed that the two-party system was really the only way to effectively, uh, you know, engage in in. American politics. Now, for my own part, one of the best arguments against that uh, was the last U.S. election, because here we had two parties that, in my opinion, utterly failed with the candidates that they offered us. What they also failed at was concealing the fact that they were intent on putting, well, at least one of those parties, you know, the candidate that they that they wanted more so than the one that the people chose. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm not attacking a party or ideology right now. I'm saying what I saw was a failure of the two-party system. And then people complained about, with the outcome of the election, the Electoral College, and saying we need to change government to be able to make sure things like this never happen again. I think the first change that should occur is we need to rethink some of the simpler structural elements of politics in America today as it is. And so that is where I would begin. I would look at ways to institute uh, alternatives to the to the major two parties, and that's why I voted Libertarian in the last election. I'm proud to say I didn't like the candidate, but I wanted to put my vote toward getting federal election funding for a third party. That was the only viable option in principle that I could see, and that's something that I would really like to see change. But another thing, just as uh, you know, a brief point I want to make, I would love to see, and this isn't so much a structural element of society as it is just, I guess, a you know an issue, but it's something that a lot of people are tackling and we're seeing more of these days. I would like to see movement toward decriminalization and legalization of certain psychoactive substances like marijuana and psilocybin, i.e. your magic mushrooms. I do not think that these are any more dangerous than the consumption of alcohol. There are dangers involved with the consumption of many substances, including sugar, you know, smoking cigarettes, plenty of things that are legal that are far more destructive than these things. And then there's also certain scientific data that supports the benefit that can be derived from the use of these substances, at least in moderation and in controlled circumstances. The the ridiculous criminalization of these and the taxpayer money that is wasted on enforcing the fact that these things are criminalized is absurd. And those are the two, I couldn't pick one. Those are the two most important things, at least that come to mind to me, that I would love to see changes. Dude, that's society. amazing. And and I'll drop a quote from Terrence McKenna on there. You know, we're all holding. Everybody's holding. You know, sil- you named all of them right there, whether it's, you know, psilocybin or marijuana, you have cannabinoids, you have these things in your system that drop naturally. So, you know, for the government to say you can't have this in a plant that you've coexisted with, that your body can drop if you do the right things anyways, that has low toxicological value, it's, it's yeah, that seems like a pretty important thing. I, I like that that's on your list. Stew on this one for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. DMT, one of the most powerful psychoactive substances known to humankind, is produced in your body, and yet it is also illegal. If they were to make it illegal, you could not buy oranges, most grasses. It's in so many different foods around us, and that's why it's been very difficult for them to enforce. Yeah, and you know, again, there's so much more that could be said about that, and I don't want to offer a simplistic you know, uh, explanation for something that really does require broader discussion. So I'll save that for another time. But at very least, in principle, those are two things that are you know, I'm, that I'm passionate about. Well, you wrote a book about it, which so. I did. <laughs> and and keep in mind, I'm not a regular user. I've never even done magic mushrooms, believe it or not. Um, but but I wanted to write a book about those things because I'm fascinated in the what the science literature says about those subjects, and I therefore am an advocate for. Uh, measures toward decriminalization and in some cases legalization. And I certainly support further scientific study of those things. Could you imagine if you were held to the fact that you had the experience with that substance? It wasn't that you ingested it. You had the experience, meaning it doesn't matter if you took the mushroom or if you meditated. That's why it's weird to me. It's like, I don't understand the regulation. You're more than anything modulating the modality, which gets back to, you know, Terrence McKenna's, you know, the Buddha story with crossing the river. Look, Buddha, I meditated for 10 years and now I can walk on water. Yeah, but the ferry's only 10 cents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, All right. So what is the most courageous thing you have ever done in your life or seen? 
Oh, that's another really tough one. You know what's funny is the first thing that came to mind, and I told you I wanted to try and go with my gut on a lot of these, there is, uh, there was like a uh, street cam uh, that, that caught an incident on film a few years ago that just fascinated me. And it involved two dogs walking across a freeway. And one of them gets hit by a car and is immobilized and is obviously badly hurt. And its little friend makes it across the street. And it's looking around and it's panicking because it realizes its friend's hurt. And the little dog runs out there and it grabs its buddy and pulls its friend out of the road. And this is all caught on camera. And a lot of people watch that and they're like, oh, that's so sweet. And to me, it is. But I'm also thinking, my God, I mean, you know, our attitude toward other life forms on this planet is so sad. You know, humans don't even think that we're on top of the food chain. We just take that for granted. And we absolutely, up until maybe the last few years, would not have looked at other animals and, and saw compassion or any kind of protective, you know, nurturing kind of thing like what we see on display in videos like that. Another that appeared online the other day was talking about a dog that was on a rooftop with its uh, friend, another dog, and the dog falls off the, the rooftop. And so the other dog jumps off trying to go save its friend. I think its friend died and that, that dog survived. But so why are these things can, courageous to me? Because, you know, the, these are animals that I don't think get their due and proper. And yet they have those same drives and I would love to see humans recognize those things more often, but in understanding that animals can feel and behave in those ways too, it seems to say an awful lot about humans in terms of our capacities for things like compassion. You know, I'd love to be able to tell you that I thought that some great general, you know, leading on the battlefield was the most courageous thing I ever saw. But really at the end of the day, what does war really get you? You know, last time I checked, the reason that we don't like war is because if we can find other ways to solve problems and we can get along, I mean, it's it, that is in the effort toward preservation rather than the destruction of nations, societies, people, groups, etc. And so, yeah, you know, I think when I can look at a video camera, you know, footage of a dog saving its little buddy like that, you know, we're always looking at other humans. Look elsewhere in nature. See the see the great message of compassion and 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 strength and and uh, you know that's interesting though. Re- regardless of the difference between humans and dogs, that shows there's compassion. There there's a sense of facing danger. There is the you know the the central storyline to to all the great myths. You know explained right there. That like what is that that you know the dog and you and I share? That's that's yeah. a powerful a powerful um, um energy. Whatever it is. It is. And, and I would just say this, I, I would apply the same thing to children, you know, who, for instance, see a, uh, you know, their mother or their father injured or something like that. And they take action and do the same thing. If you look up the stories, you want, you want a real feel good Sunday, spend an afternoon reading stories of children that save their parents and things like that. And again, not someone who has gone through the, the stages of development toward maturity that as a grown up they realize that there's either a responsibility or something else there may be nothing more than just a innate concern you know for a loved one or for a parent you know but whatever it is that drives you know a young child a pet a grown up anybody anything to to carry out a selfless act to save another that to me is courageous personified well, you just at, like opened up a great question in my mind there, which isn't even a question. It's just a, what is that? That, thank you. <laughs> well, you're so, welcome. <laughs> now, Micah, what rule do you have for yourself that you never break? And why do you think that it is important? I guess there are a lot of rules that I probably wouldn't break. This is another one that for some reason, like, like the whole embarrassing question um, that I have a hard time with, and it's not because I'm a nonconformist and someone who doesn't break rules um, or that I'm someone who is a strict, you know, I, but I, I would say this, I'm not the kind of person I think who in my lifetime, apart from the kind of rules that we all agree on in society, you know, thou shalt not commit murder, you know, protect children at all costs, you know, uh, do not steal, Things like that. I mean, those are definitely rules that I don't. But any break any in. that you like impose upon yourself. Things yeah, I, that- I, yeah, yeah. I, re- I realize you know what we're talking about here is more like a personal rule. Um, 
But I guess, again, in that sense of spontaneity, I'm not a person who, in terms of my personal values, in terms of like, if I'm alone in a room and I've got an hour to kill, you know, this is one thing I will not do. I think that one of them, honestly, um, although, again, this still is beyond what we're talking about here, but I'm not a person who believes in self-harm. I understand that there's some people who justify it. There may be even in some instances in wartime, et cetera, where that kind of thing might be justifiable. But to me, uh, and self-harm can occur in a lot of different ways, drinking too much, you know, not eating right, um, not exercising enough. You know, you may not be sitting there and cutting your, your arm or something like that. And I've known a lot of people who actually do that as a, as a means of therapeutic, you know, coping as a coping mechanism. But for me, Again, I have always operated under the idea of your body is a temple. And so one thing that I, as far as rules, will not do is is mistreat my body. Sitting too long, you know, is one of those get out, take a walk, exercise, jog if you have the time, lift weights, work out. Again, take care of your body. So one thing I won't do, one rule is I will not misuse or abuse my body if I can help it. You know, which is one thing that sucks about being a writer and a podcaster. Sometimes you are stuck in a chair for long hours and you'll start feeling that in your lower back. So, but man, you know, you are given a body. You are blessed with life and it comes in different forms. And some people may have, you know, certain things that others don't, but, you know, be thankful for what you have. And that's the other thing I would say as a rule, do not take for granted the gift that you have. The, the gifts that you are given in life, those things, you should be appreciative of those things. I don't know. I hope that's an answer. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great answer. I, there's, again, it's not a, a, not a right or wrong. It's, you know, how does, how does Micah think? How does, when Micah's walking through that proverbial, you know, uh, uh, Jack Frost, you know, poem, you know, the, the path less traveled, is there bushes in front of you? Like what, how do you choose the path? What's your modality? It's, you know, Hey, look, Micah, Micah, Here's the things that he's done. What's the scaffolding? What's the path? What's the the mental framework and the things that influenced him on the way? And you know, so that's why all these questions, you know, the answer yeah. isn't important. It's it's and, you know, and you'll the, notice the, the, with some of my answers too, Adam, that I'll just say this: that you know, I I honestly, in a lot of ways, try not to be too anthropocentric with my answers. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mo- often humans get caught up in you know the human perspective on things. And hence, I'll bring up artificial intelligence, alien life, what dogs do for their friends, you know, when they're injured, et cetera, et cetera. I, I try to see a bigger picture. And I'm not one of these guys who, you know, I get up every morning, drink my coffee, read the news, think about the three things I want to succeed at that day and how much money I can make. I mean, I'm, I'm just not one of those thinkers. I'd probably be more successful if I was, but I'm not a person who's driven by money. I'm not a person that's driven by the conventions of success in Western society. And the things that you quote. Well, I imagine if I were to offer you two plates, fame and money, and a plate of truth and value, that you would go for the truth and value. So even if you traced that, it wouldn't be what you wanted. Yeah. I mean, although I will say this, wealth and fame have their benefits. If I could have one of the two, I probably would take wealth over fame because I don't care about being well known so much as having resources. But if I had wealth handed to me, think about all the wonderful things I could do. I could, you know, make donations, I could make charitable donations, I could start institutions, I could be more philanthropic, I could fund endeavors and organizations, scientific research. Unfortunately, that takes the chatter, doesn't it? You know, it requires money. And so, you know, for me, if I aim to be wealthy, and success is a component of that. People often mistake that. They're like, oh, you just really think highly of yourself. Wow, I, this prick, I don't want to hear him motor mouth on his podcasts. If there's an element in my life where I am driven towards success, it's not for self-gratification. It is an ends to justify another kind of means, which is to feed back into society and do well. You know, And people who can't see that, people who, who stop with that peripheral, oh my gosh, this is the most arrogant person I've ever heard in my life. I'm sorry for you if you can't see any deeper than that. Micah, awesome, awesome answers. Are we um, done? Yeah, well, that's that's the first part of the list. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, whoa, that was quick. Yeah, no. Uh, so this is the point where we thank everybody for joining 13 Questions, helping us, supporting us, being uh, a part of the community. If you guys want to hear the bonus questions, Go to mantranscending.com, become a mender, get access to the premium podcast courses, writing exercises. Um, and of course, the bonus questions are coming up right here. Thank you very much, Micah. 
My pleasure. Definitely support these guys. It's good work they do. And now we're back with more questions. That was fun. Yeah. I'm loving it. <laughs> I almost welcome, got concerned when I thought we were done there. <laughs> welcome back to five bonus rounds for members. And thank you for listening. It's actually going to be a bunch more questions, but we'll fly through. <laughs> uh, what would you tell your teenage self, Micah? Oh, man. This is my favorite question on the list, I think. Let me tell you why. Because I often think I could just go back. you help your brother when you see him fall why do we act like god don't see it all why do we call them black them white them asians and use labels now that's racism i don't want no way why 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 why is there innocent people locked up for life? While some people can't say nothing nice Why do we always gotta question what all of it means? And why won't you follow your dreams? Tell me why The night when you took my dad Why'd you let me see my grandpa cry? And tell me why And why do you choose to hide Even though you was born to fly? And tell me why don't we turn from all the hate and why don't we learn from all mistakes why do i keep on wrecking these fat beats and teachers don't make more than professional athletes and why entertainment and not therapy we hope you benefit from our resources available at 13questionspodcast.com thank you for listening